Thank you. Okay. My name is Kyle Ezel, and I'm a professor of practice in the city and regional planning program at the Knowlton School of Architecture at the Ohio State University. I'm also a founding principal of Designing Local, a planning firm. So needless to say, I'm a, I'm a, a city geek. Uh, I have I've already geeked out to uh, Lee Fisher's keynote, and I'm thrilled to, to be part of this as your co mc uh, It's the kind of lineup that if I found it online, I would probably lose myself you know, alone somewhere streaming this, uh, this conference. I'd, I'd travel across the country to see it. We're really lucky to have um, people here who have big ideas, big ideas uh, to, to change cities for the better, to make them more creative, um, doers, uh, people who test their ideas on the ground. So I'm, I'm very happy and, um, and honored to be your co-MC with Shoshana Goldberg Miller. So I want to introduce today uh, session one. It's called Heritage. How did we come to the creative city's paradigm? The session is moderated by Dr. Rachel Cleet, professor and section head of the city, city and regional planning program at the Knowlton School of Architecture at The Ohio State University. My boss. <laughs> uh, there are three speakers in the lineup in this first session. The third speaker is Dr. Carl Grodak. He's a senior, a senior lecturer at Queensland University of Technology. Uh, Carl is preceded by Steve Shoney, the director of uh, the Department of Development for the City of Columbus. And first up is Renee Coyman. Uh, Renee is the Associated Fellow at the Knowledge Systems Innovation at UNITAR. So everybody help, help me welcome Renee. Come on up, Renee. Thank you, thank you. Good morning. I'm pleased and honored to be part of the Barnett Symposium today. They have offered me 10 to 15 minutes to talk. Very little time, lots of stories to tell. I won't be able to tell them all, but we'll see what I can offer you. I was very pleased, I must admit, well, I got this going, something went wrong here. I was very pleased with the introduction of the first keynote speaker because it's covered a couple of things that I will be talking about. What we have, if we discuss creative urban renewal, creative urban development, we have to realize that we're in a societal transition. We're moving from an industrial society that makes things to a knowledge society. If you make an online game, you don't make anything anymore. It's only virtual. We're moving from the real production to the virtual production. That's one thing. Second thing is there's a continuous urbanization. It was mentioned before this morning. Third one, we have strange economic times. It's very hard to get money. Banks are hesitating. Investors are hesitating. Governments are very curious what they want to invest in. So it's very strange that we have a growth that we used to is faltering at the moment. Then we have, of course, if you talk about crisis, you have to innovate, you have to change, you have to move. Where do you look for innovation? You don't look at the great firms, the big firms. You have to look at the small and medium enterprises. That's where the ideas are made. That's where the new world is created. And the last one, which is becoming more and more important, we have to take care of the sustainability discussion. But we want to avoid it or not, we'll have to take care of what we're going to produce. I'll give you a short image here. This is Rotterdam, the biggest port in Europe. What's happening here is that the old port used to be oil and container traffic. It's going to be moved out of the city. The total harbor is going to be emptied. Oil is going to move to the new polder outside in the sea. The Dutch, if they have a problem, they run to the sea. In this case, they created a polder. Oil is going out. Large container traffic is going out. It's too big. So it means that we have a total city within the city, 1,600 hectare, 
4,000 acres. It's going to be abandoned, industrial area. Nobody wants to invest, right? Old industrial areas. So what do you do with it? This is, these are the problems that we're going to face. We did a study looking at the entrepreneurial capacities of the cultural and creative industries, a study for the European Commission, 27 countries. And we were surprised to find out that 80%, more than 80% of the enterprises within the cultural and creative industries is smaller than 10 people. So you have small enterprises, we have medium enterprises, these are micro enterprises, smaller than 10. But even more surprising is that more than 50% is smaller than three. So we don't have micro enterprises, we have nano enterprises. They are so small. Lots of very small initiatives, that's the cultural and creative industries. We talk about cultural and creative industries as if it was one sector. But you have very different positions. Of course, you have the individual who's driven by artistic uh, uh, things that they want to do. You have the solo artistic person but wants to make a profit, it's more market oriented. We have creative partnerships. We have combinations of the artistic leader, the financial leader, as two different people who work together. There's the designer and manufacturing, there's, there's the investor. So we have very different kinds of uh, enterprise structures. Looking at cities, these are the people we're talking about, right? Individuals who make things that have not been there before. That's what they do. Innovation, creativity is their name of the game. That's part of their existence. Cities, it was already mentioned, demographics. We grow older, baby boomers, us, right? Be aware, we won't die. We refuse to die. We get older, we'll stay there. You, you, you're going to meet us. And, and these baby boomers, they have the old ideas, right? 60s, right? We want bicycles, we want backpacks, we want sustainable energy. Those were our dreams. We want love and peace. Well, that, that changed a little, but lots of things are still out there. So different, different, activities that have to be happening in, in the city itself. Of course, it's going to be multicultural. I know there are Americans who would like to build a wall to Mexico. <laughs> I know there are Europeans who like to build a wall to Greece, yeah. right? Dream on. They will be coming. We're going to have a multicultural society, different religions, different cultural backgrounds. We're going to move internationally, not only nationally, but internationally. So you better get used to it, I think. Changing consumer patterns. We don't buy that much anymore in the shop. You buy online. So, you know, distribution centers are growing, but the shopping malls will be empty. So these developments, a connected society, we do everything in a connected way. We are not on our own. Here, we are full-time on the internet, totally connected. Google will find us if, you, if they're looking for us. So it's a connected society that we're making. I'll give you a couple of um, European examples, because they were very nice American ones. This is a former spinning factory. Family industrial estate, family owned. Partly industrial heritage cannot tear it down. Nobody wants to invest, nobody wants to do it, but it was closed somewhere in 1974. It has been abandoned for 25 years. Then the municipality, an investment company, and the family got together, created the joint venture in order to do invest. What they did do, they tore down this piece here, tried to create apartment buildings, and the apartment buildings would create financial possibilities to develop the other area into the creative sector, the creative initiative. What happened? It's courageous to create apartment buildings in the middle of a crisis, right, about five years ago. They were surprised that they sold these apartments within six months, all of it, because people would like to live next to a creative environment. This is what it was. 
This is what it is now. They use it for creative initiatives, exhibition centers, um, the beehives. They move it into a creative environment. My second example, it's a mining area. I understand in America you have a discussion about mining cities, right? No perspectives, unemployment, poverty. That's the same here. What do you do with it, right? This is what you do. You reinvent your city. They decided that the city was about energy. Coal isn't mined anymore. They moved into uh, geothermal energy possibilities. And that got in chemical and physical industry that could use the heat, and of course they're heating the city itself. That's the economical basis in order to create a creative environment that's using all these large, huge volumes of industrial buildings. Last one, this is a textile factory. Um, they started out on a commercial initiative. You have large buildings, what do you do with it? You make a bowling alley, <laughs> right? That's space. It doesn't cost much, you don't have to invest much, you just make, you throw your balls, that's it. So that was the first thing. Second one, they got in a child daycare center, a low cost supermarket. They took a look at the migrant population. Most of it is Spanish. They started a Spanish restaurant. Second is Greek, so there's a Greek restaurant. Then they moved on to a German restaurant. It's Germany, right? You need beer, you need beer. So in the end, they had a small chapel. Now what to do with the chapel, right? Churches are not used anymore. So you don't, it's very hard to find a use for it and they turned it into a small theater. And then an interesting thing happened. It attracted a totally different public. People from the middle class and the upper middle class that would go there different times of the day, in the evening. That would go there in different times of the week, in the weekend. So the area totally developed and improved because of creative initiatives. We've done so, and I'll only show you three cities. We did, we've done this for seven cities in the northwest of Europe, mid-sized cities, which is interesting. But you need, if you want to develop these things, you need a conceptual framework. How do you look at developing cities. What are the concepts that you use? And when are you successful? When do you call it a failure? A failure? So we came up in discussion with these cities with four dimensions. First of all, it's a learning environment. People who are young now will have four or five different careers in their life. You will continuously go on with learning, inventing, changing what you're doing. So one of the dimensions that was mentioned in all those cities is educational learning activities. Second one is you need networks with gatekeepers. You need an organizational structure that will be there, not for the short term, but also for the long term time, create a value chain. You need diversity. If you only put creatives together, it's going to be boring. You need different industries. If you really want to innovate, you need very different influences. And the last one, of course, in the end, you have to make a living. You need an entrepreneurial business plan. Those were the first four dimensions. We birthed them out in core values and in indicators in order to value and measure success and failure. Take a look at the future. You might have noticed, but I'm not sure, the United Nations decided and defined the new sustainable development goals for the upcoming 15 years. And what is interesting is one of the more important goals and a separate goal is sustainable cities and communities. All the countries that are part of the United Nations organization admitted to these different goals. So you can count on the fact that these discussions are going to be part of times to come. How is it done? The toolkit, what are the lessons learned? 
First of all, you have to take time. Area development will not happen in a year, will not happen in a political period of four years time, but you need years or decades in order to develop a certain city. The second one is you have to persist. You have to create your story. You will find people who object and have all kinds of arguments to show you that you should do something different. You have to persist on your story. Communication, let people know what you're doing. Spread the word, use the media, both online and in reality. You have to tell them what's going on and you need the alliances in order to get the decisions going and done, taken for what you need. And the last one, when you go along, you have to learn because I can guarantee you, you have to be prepared for a dynamic, changing process. You will change your ideas, you will change your, your collaboration with different organizations. So you have to learn when you move along, when you start developing urban areas. That's the story for the moment. Thank you so much. Um, I am Steve Shoney. Um, I understand uh, that the keynote this morning um, claims that he said my name three times. So um, I must then find a way to, to say the name of my good friend and mentor, Lee Fisher, One. Um, at least uh, three times, if not four or five. And, and I do have to say, it was great that Lee Fisher was here this morning. <laughs> because he really is um, one of the great minds in this country in terms of thinking about cities and bringing together people to collaborate about cities. And when you talk about creative cities, the fundamental theme has to be collaboration. And, and I could do it, I could really get off really easy today and just say, you know, whatever Lee Fisher said this morning, um, and then what Renee said, and I think, uh, I have enough faith in Lee having listened to countless, countless, countless hours of him speaking. I think it was only three, but it felt like that um, <laughs> over, the, over the years that I worked with him. Um, and then what Renee said, because Renee was, was spot on. So a um, little bit about me. I am the development director for the city of Columbus. Uh, for those of you who don't know the city that well. I so Lee Fisher. <laughs> Has raised, an, uh, has raised a cor correction, and now we're at four. Um, so um, uh, I am the development director for the city of Columbus. Uh, the city, if you don't know, is um, the largest city, the largest municipality in the state of Ohio. You could actually fit the landmass of Cincinnati and Cleveland within the boundaries of the city of Columbus and still have room, extra room. Uh, we are 225 square miles. Um, we are 835,000 um, residents. Uh, it's a big place. Um, it is the 15th largest municipality in the country. The metropolitan area has about 2 million people and change, um, and it's growing rapidly. Um, the Metropolitan Housing Authority, or Metropolitan Housing Authority, sorry, the Metropolitan Planning Agency, um, MORPSI, Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission, um, about two years ago did a study that said by 2050, we'll probably add, um, uh, get my numbers right, 500,000 people. They just came out last week at their annual meeting and say if our growth patterns over the last three years continue, we could be at a million people by that time frame. So we are looking at a city and a region that is on the cusp of potentially great growth and everything good and bad that comes with that. And when you talk about the importance of creative communities, um, creative communities are going to be the places that help determine the quality of that growth. And when we look at as a strategic matter for the city of Columbus, how do we grow and how do we grow our incomes and how do we, how do we make sure that we are a prosperous, diverse, inclusive city? The key to that really is building places where people want to be. In the economic development world, the constant mantra is it's all about workforce. 
workforce, workforce, workforce. Can companies get the talent that they want and need to grow? We are very, very blessed in this city that um, we have the Ohio State University here and a number of other um, post-secondary institutions. There are over 100,000 people in the Columbus metropolitan area enrolled in post-secondary education right now. The challenge for this community is not to attract, is to attract talent, but that's not as much of a problem for us as it is for in Indianapolis or in Asheville um, or to some degree of Charlotte. We just have to keep them. All you students here, we just need to keep you. Um, and how do we keep you? There are a couple ways to do that. Um, one is to have great places um, where you want to live, and that's first and foremost. That's the one that we as a city can control. The other one is to find a partner for, a life partner for you, and that one I can't really help you with. Um, <laughs> Um, although I do have a couple, and you guys are too young for my friends who I'm trying to set up with people right now. So, um, I, you know, unless there's some of the mid-career folks who are, are single and looking, and then maybe we can, I can help you guys along. But um, those, are the, those are the things that are key for us. And the other thing that we have found, one of our mantras is neighborhoods that are dense, active, and connected will be successful. If there are people there and they're out on the streets and they're connected to each other and connected to jobs, those are the areas that will succeed. The short north, it's dense, it's active, it's well served by fiber and telecommunications and it's right on the spine uh, that connects the university and downtown. That neighborhood succeeding. The other thing that's interesting about the short north, um, I did a talk at the Ameri American Planning Association last month. Last month? Yeah, last month. Um, and it was on innovation districts. The big rage these days is you know, how, to, how do you create an innovation district around your university and how do you have space where all the tech people want to go and you, know, you need to have um, meeting places, you need to have meetups and it needs to be planned and you need all this institutional um, gathering space and you need a governance structure and you need all this. What you see in Columbus is you can actually have a great innovation area without all that. And that the example here is the short north. And the short north wasn't planned as a research and technology innovation district. It was planned as an arts district. And what you find, what we have found, what we are finding both in um, the short north today, but we're also seeing um, coming up in Franklinton. Where's Jim Sweeney? I saw him earlier. Oh, there he is, front and center. That's why I missed him. Um, by the way, another aside, Jim Sweeney has achieved the ultimate greatness in community development. Do you know what the ultimate honor is? No, he's not the mayor of Franklinton. He has a drink named after him. Um, <laughs> The Gin Sweeney um, at Strongwater, um, which is something I desperately aspire to. I've had a drink special named after me, but not, uh, not a standing drink. So um, what we're seeing is if you create the conditions for the arts and creative community, that attracts the technology community. Because that creative process is what attracts companies and drives the economy today. And so, we're really excited about that. Everything that we're looking at in terms of our neighborhood strategies, if you're here from Columbus and you pay any attention, you hear everything these days for us at the city is about how do we um, bring back up our really truly distressed neighborhoods, places like um, West, Frank West Franklinton, the Hilltop, Linden. A lot of what we're spending our time doing is thinking about how you can reconnect those neighborhoods. How do you reconnect them to jobs? How do you reconnect them to each other internally? How do you make it safe enough so that people can come out and reconnect to each other? And how do you give them the space to be creative in how they recreate their community or how they bring their community back up? And it means having a place for everybody at the table. One of the great things that I've learned through 
um, attending some of Lee Fisher's conferences, um, is the importance of inclusion. Um, not diversity. Diversity is a step to inclusion. But you can have a diverse group of people in the room and not be including everyone. It's really about listening and including everyone. I think one of Renee's comments about um, not just having the creatives in a space is really important. Because um, you have to have all types of folks in all types of spaces to be successful. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for that. Um, hit that, hit that. Um, I think the other um, comments that I wanted to make today around the importance of creative community are really, it is important to make sure that you've got the right space and the right kind of planning that Renee showed with some of the examples from Europe. Um, what we see here in Columbus is doing it on a little bit different scale. Um, so you see things in Franklinton that are on a much smaller scale. What we tend to, what we're doing in Columbus though, at this point, is much more, um, we're allowing it to be much more organic. Because what we're seeing is a rise of creative organizations that don't want to be bound by the timelines of institutions. So um, back to the technology space. Back in 2006, I think it was, there was this big planning effort to define what the, what the innovation corridor for Columbus was going to be. And there was this big plan that said, we're going to create 50,000 jobs along 315, right by all where the exits are. And Ohio State, Battelle, the city, I'm doing it in my big deep voice because this is my, <laughs> my institutional voice. Um, the institutions were going to come together to make this happen. The institutions are slow and cumbersome and we get distracted and a lot of times we find reasons to say no. What sprung up instead was organizations like um, the Idea Foundry, like uh, Wild Goose Collaborative, like pick whichever one of the startup um, incubators you want to pick that have said, you know what, we're going to define the space, we're going to define where we want to go. Institutions help us a little bit, but mostly get out of our way. And that has been a real, I think, secret to the success of the city. So now we find ourselves with a city that in the downtown and short north office market, you have no, you have literally zero, the, the statistic is that there is zero vacancy in class A office in the short north. Zero. In downtown, you have 4% vacancy in class A office space. At the same, at, in a, after a period where we've added 2 million square feet of office space in the arena district. You do this kind of planning where you give the ability for creative companies to come in, whether it be an IT company or a design company, um, and you will have economic success. So that's my semi-prepared comments. Um, I again want to thank Lee Fisher for um, <laughs> trying to keep up with me in terms of the number of shout outs that I do. Um, and I think you've got a great set of speakers coming up. You know, um, uh, Michael Bongiorno's um, on the, the panel later this afternoon. And I, we can't be in this building. Uh, we can't be in this facility without uh, recognizing Michael and everything he's given uh, to this city um, in terms of his architecture and his work. Uh, he does a fantastic job. Uh, Tony Slanik um, is a... Uh, is a great partner and friend, um, and those are the only two nice things I'll say about him. Um, <laughs> but I, I think you've got a great set of speakers coming up this afternoon, and I'm happy to take questions when we do the panel. Is this going? Great. Um, and then, pardon me, just want to make sure I'm set up. And how does this work? Right, right. right and left? Okay. Um, hi. Uh, 
Thanks so much for having me out here, Shoshana, and the symposium organizers. Um, see, the real reason I actually came here all the way from Australia is because uh, my parents are actually alumni of OSU, and they've been married for 50 years, and they met here. So I thought, I got to come out, see where they met, and see what it's like. And uh, my mom was really, especially really excited that I was coming out here. So I got to go back and report about everything that I've seen. Um, so that's, you know, that's my little, little introduction about me and why I'm here. But um, I'm really here to talk about um, the evolution of this idea of the creative city and the rise of urban cultural policy. Um, I was asked to, to really dig into some of the um, sort of big changes over time that have led to how we think about and talk about urban cultural policy and, and this creative city paradigm. And I should really start out by saying that I don't think there's any one creative city paradigm. What we really have is a set of competing ideas around, around what the creative city is, and that leads to a number of different tensions and conflicts around um, different strategies and policy approaches. And th that varies between cities as well as between countries, and, that, and that's a lot of what I'm gonna be talking about um, today. So I wanna start out by just laying the background, what I think is you know, some really familiar big picture trends going on that, that shapes where we get um, with the rise of arts and culture as a specifically urban policy tool. Um, and that comes about through three key areas that really come very apparent in the 1980s. First, restructuring of urban economies. Um, of course, we have, especially in this part of the world, deindustrialization. Um, outsourcing and suburbanization of manufacturing, um, with it a host of major challenges for cities, loss of jobs, loss of tax space, dealing with vacant space and so forth. But at the same time, we also have the emergence of a new service sector. It's very bifurcated. On the one hand, you have those really high-end, highly skilled, highly educated jobs in ICT, uh, information communication technology and finance and the creative industries, but you also have lower level service sector jobs. And these are coming into cities. Second, we have a, a mode of government called neoliberalism that's, that's becoming really strong in the 1980s. Emphasis on one, fiscal austerity, two, privatization, and three, putting cities in the position to really focus on attracting and facilitating development. And so cities, do need to have that distinction that our keynote was talking about. So there's really a push on being distinctive and standing out. Third is social change. A number of things going on, again, really clear in the 1980s. Anti-suburban <laughs> rhetoric, um, increasing interest in urban lifestyles and this idea of urban living, um, but also new ways to define who we are. You know, the old way of defining Identity might have come from religion or from union membership or your work, and, and those things can still matter, but increasingly, it's also about what we consume and what we buy, how we dress, how we present ourselves. I mean, today, I think like the buy local movement would be a really great example of this, of consumption defining our identity. Uh, and, and these, again, 1980s is when this is really, all these things are coming together. And in terms of forming around urban cultural policy, it, it really all gets distilled into these two key policy narratives. One, we have the arts and commercial cultural sectors like film and music, design, and, and, and media-based industries kind of being lumped together with ICT under the creative industries. And this is seen as driving this knowledge economy. Uh, and defined by really high levels of human capital, innovation economies, and so forth. And the creative industries are at the leading edge of this as a really a replacement for manufacturing. Well, we've lost manufacturing, we're gonna bring in the creative industries. And, and the other way that urban cultural policy starts to um, really come into the context here, of course, is as a vehicle for consumption. And so you have really major development, 1980s forward, around flagship cultural projects, arts districts, big cultural events, um, marketing art scenes, and so forth, to attract people to city centers, um, stimulate tourism consumption, 
creating these quality of life amenities that are going to attract people to place, attract businesses, and so forth. And, you know, out of those three big pictures around the economy, governance, and social change, I mean, they get distilled into this. And, and as a result, you see arts and culture taking center stage as specifically urban policy tools. Um, and it's on this we start to have this layer of different policy strata that kind of uh, really explains lots of different ways that cities in the US and elsewhere do planning and policy around the arts and cultural sectors. And it's really beginning to move beyond this kind of classic approach to arts policy, which is you know the so-called arts welfare, where um, museums and theater and heritage are subsidized as a public good. And it's really looking at and coming up with new justifications for cultural policy uh, and a really strong drive around an economic rationale in particular. But it's also about reflecting on and addressing with that fiscal austerity cuts in arts funding in the 80s and 90s um, and realizing that, that culture is much more than just the fine arts. You know, it's also commercial cultural sectors, it's community arts and so forth. And you start to see these different waves of cultural policy emerge that are very much tied to urban development. And first we have the economic impact studies uh, that many cities, many arts administrators have been doing um, to kind of demonstrate the value of the arts and try to like justify why they deserve to have that continued funding. And of course, we also have culture-led redevelopment. Again, the flagship projects, the arts districts, and so forth. Um, finding ways to create amenities in city centers to redevelop property, get people back downtown. And, and we see these kind of strategies from everywhere, from San Francisco to Cleveland. I mean, they're ubiquitous, really. Um, and a big part of it, though, is to provide amenities not just for tourism, but for building those office districts in the CBD that is occurring in so many places around this time. A third sort of stream coming out at this time is really very different and kind of, I think in some sense, under the radar in the US a lot. Um, although partners for liberal communities were some of the first people in the US talking about cultural planning. Um, but but a, a big push for this was actually out of Australia from a guy named Colin Mercer, who was at Griffith University in Brisbane, um, talking about, again, expanding this idea of what we plan for when we plan for culture. And, and for him, culture is everything that counts for a community. And it's about looking at your cultural resources as ways to plan for place-based community development. It's really prefiguring a lot of the creative placemaking discussions that are going on now. Uh, and it's at this time that we see the development of cultural asset mapping. And this is not done just to um, look at the development and assets you have around arts and culture in your community, but it's also as a capacity building tool, bring people together and, and enhance community participation. Another direction coming out of the 1980s is a rediscovery of the culture industries. Uh, so looking at those commercial cultural sectors, media, design, arts-based industries as a specific production system. And so you have people like Alan Scott in the US, Andy Pratt in the UK, Justin O'Connor in Australia, all these people around the world looking at this, um, these, these sectors because they specifically represent a mode of flexible specialization, uh, meaning they really represent what's going on with the changing economy in that these are highly agglomerative industries, they, hide, they, they cluster very closely, they rely on very spe specific skill sets, and they change very quickly based on trends and, and, and people work on a lot of uh, subcontract sort of basis. And so these industries represent this sort of new kind of a, a, a look at economic geography. But all these different discussions are happening and, and around this time and then it's not until the 1980s that the creative city concept kind of builds on all of this. It's already been happening for a decade plus. And so around 95 or so, uh, Franco Bianchini and Charles Landry start talking about the creative city. Um, and you have discussions around the creative industries, especially in UK and Australia and later Asia. Uh, and then you have Richard Florida's creative class coming really separately in the US in the 2000s. And a number of competing ideas, like this idea of the artistic dividend, uh, many others reacting to the creative city idea um, and, and, and looking at it 
in uh, not necessarily a positive way. And, and more recent changes and, and uh, attempts like creative placemaking and some other things to kind of rethink what we mean by a creative city. And so I want to like make sure I stress that this isn't like an evolution of policies. We very much have a subsidized arts still exists, but this is a layering of different policies that different cities use depending on context and, and, and so forth. And so just to go through three of these key variants on the creative city, First is Landry's uh, and Bianchini's idea on the creative city. And, and really what they're talking about is a change in organizational culture that really reflects, because I don't have time to get in a lot of the case studies, I'm so glad our speakers had so many great examples of what they're really talking about. Bringing together planning and economic development and cultural affairs to work on new ways of doing uh, redevelopment and governance. Um, but what they're also saying is that the city is a cultural resource and that we need to use this to kind of attract that new economy that's developing uh, around finance and ICT and, and so forth. And so really prefiguring some of Richard Florida's ideas. The other big drive around the creative city discourse is with the creative industries. And this concept really takes off in the UK through the Department of Culture, Media and Sports Creative Industries Task Force. And they really hone in and pull together the arts and cultural industries with ICT. And, and this is the really the push for that label of creative industries as sort of wealth and job creation. And then immediately following that in the 2000s, uh, you, in Australia actually is QT forms the first faculty of creative industries with a very different idea on what the creative industries mean previously. It's building on this idea here, but they're looking at it as an innovation system. And basically arguing that the, the creative activity is intrinsic to all act, economic activity and it, it, the focus really needs to be around innovation and intellectual property development. So you're, they're moving it really sort of out of the urban sphere and really away from uh, a lot of the focus that was with cultural industries and cultural planning on, on some of the social dimensions of, of what's going on. And then finally, what's had the most impact in the US is Richard Florida's work on the creative class. Um, and you know, this is a fun, I, it's a nice cartoon, but basically uh, this kind of helps capture what Florida was arguing is that we need to create these certain places that are gonna attract uh, highly skilled, highly educated people. Uh, and then his ideas are really taken in a myriad of different ways that, you know, we, we create these amenities and the creative class will, will come. And it's, it's really at this time, af after these layering of creative industries, but really Florida's work, that we just see this explosion of the creative city um, language and policy documents and economic development and cultural affairs and so forth. Um, but what, I mean, I think, the real upshot of all this is that a lot of the work tends to be focused on language. A lot of it is really relabeling a lot of what's already in existence, not really changing and coming up with a lot of new programs. And we also have a lot of critics critiquing creative industries, critiquing creative class work, because for, for all the really amazing redevelopment projects that come out, Critics also say that it's also exacerbating inequality. We're not really addressing that bifurcated service economy that we have. And the creative city, creative industries language really just kind of pushes that along without really dealing with that. Uh, and in fact, what a lot of these problem projects do are city center redevelopment projects that gentrify urban places, displace many people, and it's, it's really contributing to that inequality. Uh, and so as an urban cultural policy, this just these creative city policies are not working. And I mean, I think what the reality is though, they're not really about cultural policy so much as just using arts and culture as a vehicle for really often real estate development and economic development. And, and so that distinction's important to, to make. But again, we, we still see along with this language and this adoption of economic development, the arts welfare model still subsists. We still have percent for public art programs. We still have a lot of money that goes to really big arts institutions and arts organizations rather than the community sector. We still have the culture-led redevelopment. Uh, and now we have creative placemaking. 
And this, to me, creative placemaking, it comes out of the NEA's Our Town grant program, and it's really spread the idea of it and the meaning of it, again, in very different ways. But for the NEA, you know, it, it's, it's really primarily a grant program, but it's about funding projects that are around place-based community development and building community partnerships and community capacity. That's what creative placemaking is about. And so it's a really, I think, bringing back in that social agenda from cultural planning, a really positive change around how we think about incorporating arts and culture, broadly speaking, into urban policy. But yet at the same time, critics charge that they're not dealing with gentrification. They're not really thinking through what the impacts of the different projects are. And creative placemaking is really, if you look at the things that are funded, it's just a huge eclectic list of projects. So a really positive step that, that still needs more attention and more work and thinking through on, on how this is going to be done. And the other, in closing out, the other upshot of, of the creative city language is some new alternatives that are emerging. And I just came across this National League of Cities document just before I put the PowerPoint together, How Cities Can Grow the Maker Movement. Um, the, this this so-called maker movement is one way we're seeing an evolution of creative city policy, if you want. It's this rediscovery of an interest in craft and artisanal production alongside creative industries, high-tech development with, through things like 3D printing. And I think it, this has kind of started out as a cultural movement, but it, National League of Cities are taking it over as, as something, as a form of economic development. The other thing that's really under the radar with cultural policy that I think is extremely important and that needs to be talked about more in this creative city context is really this return to actual production and making things, but beyond the maker movement. The other narrative that's going on over the last five years in many cities in the US is a rediscovery of manufacturing and a promotion of manufacturing. And the recognition that it's not high volume, low cost production that is going on here, but it's very small, it's often urban, niche manufacturing. And the, the part of the discussion that is not coming out that I think cultural policy has an important role to play is that most of what's being made are cultural products. It's apparel and furniture and jewelry and food products, and that's what's defining the new urban manufacturing that's going on in this country. Um, and I think it's a whole new way of thinking about moving beyond that cultural consumption and amenities-based approach and getting towards thinking about what people actually do, what they make, and have that as a directive for cultural policies and any kind of creative city agenda that we might have moving forward around cultural production. So, thank you. on in a minute. Am I, I'm on now. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Rachel Cleet. I'm the section head for city and regional planning at the Ohio State University's Milton School of Architecture. And it's my pleasure to uh, moderate your questions with this wonderful, this wonderful set of panelists. Um, I have to say, this is a wonderful follow-up to our keynote with Lee Fisher. Just putting the plug in there for you, Steve. Thank you. Yeah, just that I, 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 got, I got my six in. I, All right, well, I don't, yeah, I, 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 I don't know. Left, Lee, I don't even I, see him out there anymore, so I'm not even going to. Okay. All right. <laughs> so this is your time. We have about 35 minutes for questions. Uh, there is a microphone in the audience that will be floating around to you if you raise your hand. So this is your time to ask questions. What questions do you have for our panelists? And there's a right back there. Please say your name before you speak. 
Thank you. My name is Chrissy Thomas, and I'm the executive director of Mary to Main Street, about two hours south of here. And my question might be too specific, but do with it what you will. I'm curious what you think the key characteristics are of local governments who are supportive of everything that you're saying. So developing a creative economy, supporting economic revitalization in a downtown district. Um, we have a very strong partnership with our local city, and I'm just wondering what recommendations or what do you see of supportive local governments that we would be able to take back to our town? Who would like to? Steve, do you want to talk about that? I'll, I'll take a I'll take a crack at it. Um, you know, one thing that um, uh, there's three words that I know a meeting is going well um, if I hear these words said frequently and hopefully in this order. What if we? blank. Um, if you can get a city government where you're hearing that in meetings with outside folks, if you hear those three words in that order, well, if you hear those three words it, anywhere, what if, and then you add the we, it's generally a good thing. That's the soft, fuzzy answer. I think, you know, it is leadership that is willing to um, uh, think beyond um, what the loudest voice says. Uh, I think, you know, we, we deal with this every day where, um, whether it's within the administration or with our friends at city council, um, there's a natural tendency to deal with what is the loudest voice. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, really being the voice that says, okay, this is, change is coming, change, you know, no city, city stays the same unless you're Colonial Williamsburg, and maybe then you can say you do. <laughs> um, but other than that, change is coming, and so what, how do we want to shape the change? We'll get it wrong, and, and also admitting, we're wrong. Okay, we're, we're wrong. We know what we say is going to happen is not going to happen, but what is the direction that we want to try and shape it and be very clear about that? Those are the cities that I think are, are engaging as I look around the country. Anyone else want to, Renee? I might, I might react. I was, I was very interested in, in your remarks about, I think it was Columbus, yeah. uh, because what you need on the one hand is a long-term planning. If you want to have a creative Columbus, that's going to take years, decades. And at the same time, you have these bottom-up, anarchistic, idiotic initiatives. That's creativity, <laughs> right? You need, you, need, you need the artists to be artists. You need to be creative and they won't fit in the long-term planning perspective. So what I liked about your story is that you had some kind of possibility to combine these two, to allow this anarchistic, this strange, weird people who start urban farming and use bicycles and do things that you never imagined in your city. Chaos. And at the same time, that's part of creating that creative Identity. So I was very interested in your, your combination of those two. Yeah, no, no I, I often joke around the office that I, I hate the democratic process and, and the life would be much easier if I just controlled everything. Um, <laughs> but but um, we wouldn't do as well as a city. Um, we have to be open for that. And they warned me that I needed to turn my phone off, otherwise, I was going to get strange text things. So um, anyway, yeah. Carl, do you have Yeah, sure, I can add something. I mean, I think balance is really important. Uh, so, and I mean that in a couple ways. One, it's really creative projects, but what's, what's the outcome of those? Who are they for? Uh, is there planning in place as places change so that everyone can stay and enjoy that creative environment and preserve that creative environment in a sense? The other thing is thinking outside the center. So much of creative city planning is hyper-obsessed on the center of the city. And especially in the US, inner suburbs need a lot of attention, and we're pretty much ignoring that. And there's no reason why we can't have creative city planning outside the city center and, and use, start using those interesting ideas for different, different means for different people in different places. What other questions do you have? Asim, in the front. Hi, my name is Asim Inam. I'm the director of the Laboratory for Designing Urban Transformation. I'm currently based in Toronto. Really enjoyed all the presentations. 
Uh, this question is for Carl Grodak. Uh, you made a really good point that uh, one of the biggest criticisms of the creative cities approach has been the approach doesn't really deal with very fundamental issues like inequality, poverty, race. And this has been, the criticism has been around for a while. And I was just curious to know, do you know of examples where cities have actually taken this criticism to heart and said, okay, how can we de address these very critical issues of inequality, poverty, and race and modify the creative cities approach to address that? Uh, I mean, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I think one thing that I should make really clear of that too is that a problem I have is that it, that criticism is often labeled or leveled at artists and arts organizations. And, and really they're kind of put in this position of being seen as, for example, like gentrifiers when they, they, they're living and doing what they do in a place. They're not the ones who have the economic power that really transforms places in a way that affects people negatively. And so I think a lot of, a lot of what gets leveled at the creative city strategies is really also, it's just the nature of a market economy and an entrepreneurial city and how they do business. And really they're just scapegoating on arts and culture quite often. Um, I think there are probably some examples in Europe to answer your question more specifically where you have people coming out in the streets and protesting gentrification. Uh, around affordable housing and cities occasionally listening to them. Um, Hamburg, maybe Berlin, Germany, that start to preserve squatter housing and, and maintain that sort of um, uh, type of housing to some extent. Uh, but by and large, you know, it's, it's, it's an economic development program usually. And I think maybe the, the, hopefully that's where creative placemaking can come make a positive difference because it's, it comes more from a community development angle and which I think takes a more holistic look at urban development than economic development often does. Okay. Yeah. Can I talk to that a little bit too? So my uh, portfolio spans everything from code enforcement, housing, we have the city's land bank which owns 1,200 of the worst of the worst properties in the city, vacant and abandoned houses. Um, code, planning, land bank, our community relations operations, and then our economic development team. And I think part of how I think that structure is important um, because I'm not allowed to think about just one. So we have a deficit of affordable housing in the city. And so when we look at the impacts of doing a certain kind of a project somewhere, that's part of my metric as to how to, how to manage that. So when you see cities that separate those functions, I think you add to the risk of the economic development and housing, essentially, because it's essentially a housing issue, uh, operating in conflict. What other questions are there in the center? So this, my name is Eric Hogan. I uh, work for the City of Columbus Department of Public Utilities as a GIS technician. And so I know that we have a pretty big footprint as far as the buildings, like we have, uh, the city proper goes out to like Canal Winchester or like farther than maybe even Gahanna, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So it's like, how do you see, I mean, it could be for anyone, but especially for developing, because planning the density, because for transit to work, we need density. So how do you see that playing in? Because we can either do concentric, nodal, maybe a combination as far as pulling our resources together. Yeah, um, it's, so the question, I mean, the question essentially is how do you handle um, encouraging density and a uh, city like Columbus, which is your prototypical Midwestern flat, um, unconstrained by um, physical boundaries kind of a city. And there are a couple ways that you do it. I mean, and it's a big question for us. So, you know, for the last, I would say probably from 1990, and this it probably goes back further than that, but let's just draw an artificial line, 1990 through um, 2000, 
2010, 11, 12, the idea was to grow for the sake of growing uh, from the city perspective. We're starting to ask that question differently and ask, okay, if we're going to grow out, um, what is the strategic advantage for the city as an enterprise? And when I say it as an enterprise, I mean bottom line, financial, what are the implications? Um, you know, the, the, um, I love these rankings of um, cities. And if you look at them consistently, the cities that, you know, and what I'm talking about like small suburban cities, the cities that always rank the best are the ones that have no residents and lots of businesses um, because they've got all the money in the world. Um, and I'm not saying we go to that, um, you know, when you, and that's kind of the sort of, when you look at these, you know, xyz.com rankings. Uh, I'm not saying we go to that, but it's an important question to look at and say, okay, what is in the strategic advantage of a city? I, I think our advantage is to grow up. It's density means lower carbon footprint. It means less impact. It allows you to get to all the good transportation things. Um, but it is a really, really hard conversation to have to tell someone that they're going to be right next to an 11-story tower. Um, I'm looking at Betsy Pandora from the short north, um, <laughs> who has that conversation a lot. Um, and so, um, you know, that's a really hard conversation to have, but it's a conversation we have to have in this community. There was another hand. Oh, Betsy, go ahead. Yep, wait for the mic. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. I'll have that density conversation with you on Friday. <laughs> um, so my name is Betsy Pandora. I'm the executive director of the Short North Alliance. I appreciate being used as an example and have the privilege of working in the Short North Arts District, which really I fundamentally agree with you is an innovation district and has grown to be that organically. Carl, I was really, really struck by what you had to say about how uh, so many of these creative strategies have really resulted in economic and real estate development. And certainly in the short north, we're experiencing that. And so my question for you and for all of you on the panel is, with these creative strategies fueling economic and real estate development, how do we preserve opportunities for arts and culture when the market pressures that are the result of that economic and real estate development make that really hard? Yeah, I mean, I would, I would answer that by understanding we, we know enough how it happens and that it's going to happen and to build policy in place in advance for affordable housing, inclusionary housing, the land banking programs that he's talking about, having that in place and having the political will to have a more inclusive vision of urban development than just chasing that dollar. Um, but I think the challenge is that the city doesn't own all the property. And so we do need some creative, perhaps incentives, to think about how we have a better range of housing and business spaces. Um, one interesting example that is brand new in San Francisco, and I think we were, I was telling Trishan about this yesterday, is in some of their manufacturing districts, they realize that San Francisco is an incredibly gentrified city, that they're losing working class jobs, and so they want to preserve manufacturing. And so in certain parts of the city now, they're requiring any new development to have manufacturing space put in, uh, along with whatever residential they're going to have or office that's going to bring them that higher return. And, and so that's just one example. And it's also a really amazing example of, of trying to support that manufacturing that's actually under the radar fairly strong, even in San Francisco. Renee or Steve, do you have a, they want to add? Well, one of my problems is I, my, my background is European. And if you talk about European, you will talk about the state. Yeah, it's, different. it's the state's function. So mm -hmm. in, in every renewal process in Europe, you would have a democratic process that you would keep everybody, everybody's going to be involved in the decision making what's going to happen. That's one thing. Second thing is we have more social movements, I think, that put a pressure 
on both the real estate developers, both the financial sector and the governmental sector. So there's more social pressure probably if we compare it to the American situation. Oh, yeah. American is more market oriented and perhaps financially based, economically based. I'm, I'm hesitating here, but you, you tell me, you tell me. In Europe, it would be impossible to think of uh, not involving the social movements within what you're going to do and what you're going to develop. So it might, it might be a little bit different. I, I myself, I don't find um, a, a contradiction in talking about the economical development and the cultural development, because in, in my idea, they go together very well. It's not that much, you know, we could discuss why artists are poor. Right? And there's a light discussion that we could, we could follow. But it's, 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 it's a basic dynamic in society that the artists have a specific position, creatives have a specific position. These are very small enterprises, right? If you take a look at the income, I mean, if they make an average, a medium income, then they're doing very well. Most of them are far below the average income level. So that's, that's part of the, the profession that you choose, part of your, the social position that you want to have, part of the identity that you, part of the career that you want to have. It's a very complex social process that's going on. Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. then I'll call on. <laughs> so it, it's, it, I, I would say if you talk about urban development, you have to take in, in account all these different processes. I talk about the social, I talk about the economical, and I talk about the cultural development as one stretch of urban planning. Some, some telephone is causing that buzzing noise. Right. You don't have to, yeah, just, just take it away. Take it away. <laughs> So, you can, the, you can, you can, it's so nice. It's 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 so nice. I've got a kind of private. I've got a, I got a private secretary now. <laughs> all speakers will have a basket in the back into which they should put their phones. <laughs> right. Okay. Steve, do you want to add to this discussion of um, no. industries? No. <laughs> ask. You know, you're never supposed to ask a question to which you do not want the answer. Yeah. No, I, I I think their comments are well said. I you know. Just from a very practical standpoint, and Betsy and I have had this discussion, I mean, it, it, this does become one of those questions where when people look to the city to subsidize keeping cheap art space, um, you know, and I look at the short north, I say, okay, once we've got stuff over on the other side of I-71 figured out and have those people living all in deep safe and sanitary housing, then I'll worry about whether the artists need to have subsidized rental space. Mm -hmm. What other questions do you have? In the back, uh, there's a... There are two of you. And I, I, let me just, I'm presenting a false dichotomy, but it's, you know, that's some of what, that's some of the context, you gotta look at it. Well, what I see happening is you have the abandoned industrial areas, right? They're going to be used by the creative industries at below market price. When they're successful, the price will rise. And then the investments come back and they move out the creatives because it's going to be expensive for them. There's a whole dynamic of urban nomads, if you want, creative nomads that move around in the cities. So we need dynamic models. It's, it's a total dynamic situation. You cannot take a look at a certain yeah. neighborhood and then isolate it and think that that is what you talk about when you talk about a creative city. No, it's a dynamic system of, of a creative ecology, if you want to call it that way. Go ahead in the back. Your name? Hi, um, I'm Susanna. I just finished my first year in the Arts Policy and Administration Master's Program here at Ohio State. And listening to this talk, it got me thinking, so creative cities are inherently a very local process, but how do you all perceive like the development of them as a, like, can you think of examples or what would you like to see as a means of encouraging more like national and international relationships? Anyone? <laughs> well, I don't know that it's inherently local. I mean, just think from a cultural production perspective, people are marketing and selling their work around the world. And, you know, part of that maker movement that I mentioned, of course, is tapping into 
dig, you know, social media and digital technology and um, to market your work. Um, so you can have uh, an artist working in Newcastle, Australia, just small industrial city selling their work to someone in Columbus, Ohio. Um, so that, I mean, that's one way. And then I think we could scale up and think about other global relationships that occur that I don't think any of it's really local, but it's, it's all tied together. Uh, Renee, you probably have. But I think there are two dimensions, right? When, when we, of course, we discuss at, in this conference, we discuss the urban development. So we take a look at the urban and the local uh, developments that are going on. But at the same time, if you take the creative economy itself, that's more and more global. Mm. I mean, mo most, most of our products are at least digital based or, or the whole production communication part. That's a global world. It's not bound to some kind of a neighborhood. People could move and change and, and, and cooperate in very different places of the world in order to create um, an online game. You need a musician, you need a, a script, you need characters, you could do that online, you could do it together. You don't have to be in a specific place. But if you want to create a, a, a creative city, and that's the, that's the discussion we have, I mean, then you have to take a look at this variety, complexity, and, and the, the, the different influences that create that city atmosphere. And I was very interested in, in to define your identity as a city. That was an interesting topic that came up this morning. You have to start to define what's exactly specific on your city. And most of the time, the larger cities have done that very well, but this, the mid-size cities are very, it's not that easy to define what exactly mm -hmm. the quality of that specific urban environment is. And I, Columbus hasn't done that well. Um, mm. And this is the second time in a, mm. frankly, in a week and a half that this has come up. We had somebody else um, come in from out of town looking at us from a small business standpoint, and he right. made that same point. Right. Um, to your question about, you know, the internationalization, the globalization of the arts, I think the other thing you do at a city level is you really look at what are your lead, lead arts institutions and make sure they have a strong international program. So here that would be um, the Greater Columbus Arts Council, making sure that the Arts Council is bringing in voices from around the world. The university does a great job of that just by the nature of the institution itself and its draw. Um, and I think you also look to uh, organizations like the sister cities. Um, there's where a lot of the cultural interchange happens. I, guess I just want to ask you all along the same lines. I mean, there's also this incredible demographic change that Lee talked about earlier and uh, incredible migration and refugee movement across the world that I, I have to think is also part of this um, resources for cities as they think about their creative uh, possibilities. Would that be an accurate, would that be part of what you're, you're talking about? I, yeah. Uh, yeah, I yeah. would yeah. certainly support that. There was another question back there in the way back. Way back. Hi, my name is Charity. I'm an undergrad at Ohio State in Arts Administration. Um, I had a question for um, Steve Shoney, and um, it's kind of a multi, like there's multiple parts to it, but I'll try and keep it simple. Um, you said in reference to the Hilltop and Franklinton area and the urbanization there, that you wanted to reconnect, bring up, and give them creative spaces. What do you mean by give, and who is them? If by, if by give, you mean finance and assist, um, and if by them, you mean the artists who already live in the neighborhood, I agree. But as far as creative spaces are concerned, don't you think creatives, um, sorry, <laughs> don't you think creatives um, already know how to best create creative spaces for themselves for maximum artistic value who already live in the neighborhood? And how do you plan on partnering with artists who already live and create there in order to avoid gentrification, but still create economic stability, which is your goal? Um, <laughs> OK, so first of all, um, well done in terms of pointing out um, my language. Um, no, in, in all seriousness, look, the, the um, language matters. Uh, you know the. The give and the them. Um, you're right. You know, I one of my other answers to a question was um, focused on the word we and the the need to create together. So, at, in all seriousness, kudos for calling me out on that. Um, 
to the question in terms of, um, I, I think it's essentially how do we put that together? Um, and what is the role of different partners? Uh, you know, we honestly, we have two roles. One is to be, kind of use um, Teddy Roosevelt's bully pulpit to talk up areas and really generate interest and get things, folk. we have more than two. We have that role, which is a lot of what we're doing. So getting everyone in the community thinking about um, what does the community need? And then we spend a lot of time engaging the community to say, what are your ideas for solutions? That we, what are your, the community's ideas that we, the city, as an, as an enterprise and as an institution, need to help implement? Um, we don't do, we at the city don't do anything on our own um, in the space of development. The things that we do on our, on our own are, Look, I'm, I'm, we don't police on our own. We don't build roads on our own. We as the, the enterprise of the city doesn't do anything on its own. It is all a community engagement process. Where we do that community engagement process well, things work well. Where we don't do it well, there tends to be much more conflict. Things take longer. We make mistakes. Um, to my point earlier about, you know, I. I often say, you know, I, I'm sick of this democratic process. I wish I just ran everything. I know that in reality, it's that community engagement process. So your idea about how do, your question about how do we look at an area like the Hilltop and, dis, and determine where are, what is needed in terms of the cultural and art space, where do we put that? That has to be a process that's a long engagement process. And we're actually going to be hiring some folks to help us with that to specifically concentrate on how do we take neighborhoods that have been in decades of decline and engage with the community, engage with everyone that's there. And when I say everyone, I mean everyone. And determine how we move as a collective, not we as the city, but as a collective, the community and the city together. So I think your question is, is spot on in terms of how do we do it. And it really has got to be a collaborative process. There did, was I, an, did I answer it? Yeah. Okay. There is another question among the students. Yes, thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Min Gyeong, and I'm a doctoral candidate of the Department of Art Administration, Education, and Policy at DOSU. And um, personally, I think we cannot avoid to experience gentrification in the process to develop places based on art and culture. So that would be the reason why we are thinking about how to sustain cultural assets in a place. But uh, for some reasons, while taking your presentation, I think um, without gentrification, a place would be hard to attract people to their place. So what do you think about that? I, actually, I want to, that makes me something I, I should have clarified when I was saying some of my comments too is the reality is that like, First off, that most places that have concentrations of the arts don't really gentrify. Um, like we've done uh, with some of my former PhD students, I've done large studies of the United States, and it, we get the news stories of the Williamsburgs and, and Mission District in San Francisco and so forth, and every city has their one area, but really look at the geography of the arts. They're, they're concentrated within regions, but they're actually fairly dispersed, and a lot of that is not necessarily happening. And the arts actually do play a community development role in many places. They're associated with reducing levels of poverty, for example, in, in some areas. Like, so areas with more arts organizations tend to see poverty declining at uh, a quicker rate than other similar places. I mean, I think that's just one thing based on your comment to say, I think it's really important to stress that there's not a causal relationship there uh, necessarily. Um, but also, I. I there's already people living in places when the arts are there, so not necessarily needing to attract people, but maybe helping to remake those places for the people that already live there. I mean, maybe that's the, like the kind of way you want to look at the question rather than assuming you have to bring people in from somewhere else to make a place attractive. Okay, thank you. So I, I want to end 
with one question that I'm going to use my moderator's capacity <laughs> to uh, ask. <laughs> So I, I've been really, as I've been listening to all the conversations this morning and starting with the keynote and then your presentations, I come back to this relationship between economic development and, and, the, and the arts and, and uh, placemaking and the role of those things in creating vital places that people want to live. And I also think about the, one of the things that Lee said earlier, and that's true, which is the, that 80% of the jobs in the U.S are service jobs, in that creative jobs, or at least tech jobs, tend to create, and actually true in um, some of these arts jobs too, these jobs are not high paying jobs that are being created. And if, um, as Renee talked about, the United Nations goals, poverty reduction, there's also any equality as part of this vision of a sustainable future, and that arts and culture are at the center of it, how do we reconcile these two things? Anyone can say. I, I yeah. mean, I, I, one possible solution is picking up on my last comment again to look at urban manufacturing. Um, it's not just about small artisans, but it's also people that make architectural components. They, they, they make furniture and not necessarily high design furniture, but it provides an opportunity for a middle skill level jobs where we're seeing this very, again, bifurcated workforce, and it is connected with cultural production. Uh, and I think there's a lot of avenues there for that kind of workforce development that we just haven't really explored far enough. Well, you, you might want to make a difference between the market-oriented disciplines within the cultural field and the more basic arts, if mm -hmm. you want to call it that way, because there are different, if, if you talk about an architect, if you talk about fashion, if you talk about industrial design, those are market-oriented initiatives, and they know what clients they want to have, they have a market-oriented, they have a price, it's a marketing approach, so that's very different from, from if you talk about uh, music or dance, or so. there are differences in these things, and you have to approach them probably in a different way in order to develop an economical uh, uh, basis. I mean, you know, the biggest thing for me is we really try not to look at economic development and community development separately anymore. Mm. Um, it really, because when you look at um, what, if you look at it from the employer side, the employer is all about attracting, as I said in my earlier comments, is all about attracting workforce. Um, and the workforce is all about place with diversity mm. and inclusion. Mm. And so um, there's a reason why our strongest markets for office are some of our strongest communities. There's a reason why Polaris here in Columbus, which is, I mean, if you, you guys don't know Columbus, but if you could picture, you know, the fortress of a shopping mall, Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> circa, you know, 1990, that, that's okay. it. I mean, it's okay. big. Okay. Um, they're, what they're doing with their um, remaining parcels is building mixed-use development that integrates office, residential, and retail. Right. Um, same thing's happening at Easton, which is sort of the trans is kind of that first transitional town center where you tried to integrate things. The next big, ha only half of the office capacity at Easton is built. But what ha what's going to happen for the remainder is it's all going to be integrated with much more residential. Because again, that is where um, everything is moving. So when you look at how do you incorporate cultural development into that, mm. um, that has to be a piece of it because in order to have those great places that both people want to live and so therefore if people want to live there, workers or employers are going to want to come, you've got to have all that in one place. Well, I want to thank, thank you, thank you so much for your talks today and your Let's comments. thank all of our panelists and our moderator. Thank you. This is wonderful. Now, uh, actually, we have lunch for you in the pavilion, so you can go back.
outside into the stairway where you, where you came in and go upstairs to lunch. Feel free to look around the museum and please be back for 1.15. Thank you.